Uh, very excited to have a, a, a distinguished professor and presidential chair in information studies at UCLA, uh, Christine Borgman. She is highly accomplished and uh, she is the author of more than 250 publications in information studies, computer science and communication. And at UCLA she directs the Center for Knowledge Infrastructures with research grants from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the National Science Foundation and many other sources. She is a world authority on uh, data science, data sharing, um, information sciences, and uh, how that can be communicated uh, effectively. She is the author of uh, several books, including one I'm sure she's going to mention uh, in her presentation. We're absolutely delighted to have her, uh, as well as uh, her colleague uh, Irena Pasqueta, who's a research assistant uh, also at the Center for Knowledge Infrastructures. Um, she's also a PhD candidate in the Department of Information Studies uh, at UCLA. And she's working on her dissertation on data sharing, reuse practices in molecular biology and genomics. Um, and she has research interests in open science frameworks, uh, science governance models, and in more uh, general, the uh, ethics and policies behind data sharing, uh, code sharing, um, and uh, other practices for open science. We're absolutely delighted to have the both of you, and we look forward to your presentation. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind our listeners that uh, you have an opportunity to send in your questions via the little uh, GoToWebinar question submission system uh, during the talk. And in, uh, in the last few minutes uh, uh, of the hour, we'll take uh, some time to read off some of those questions um, for our speakers and and get some answers to them. So without further delay, um, uh, Dr. Borgman, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to uh, speak with us today, um, and uh, uh, Dr. Pesqueto as well. Thank you, Jack and uh, Crystal, and to uh, the whole group. And it's an honor to be part of this. As, uh, as you did, said in the introductions, we've been uh, working with uh, National Science Foundation and um, uh, the Sloan Foundation, and uh, a little bit more indirectly th with the National Institutes of Health, because one of the projects that we're studying that um, Irena will talk about as the case study here that is her dissertation uh, is funded by NIH, and then um, I'm, I'm, of course, on a number of coordinating bodies, including a strategic planning panel for uh, data for the, for the NIH and National Library of Medicine. Uh, why data? Sharing and reuse are hard to do is a huge and, and kind of book length topic, certainly more than we can do in, in 45 minutes or so today. So what we hope to do is give you a larger frame and point you to some other sources to think about it. Uh, I'll spend the first 15 or 20 minutes giving a big picture and then Arena will do her case study and I'll come back and do the wrap up. Uh, for starters, I want to give you this uh, larger framing around data sharing policies. We've been thinking about open access to publications and open data in various ways for several decades, and we've had open data repositories for 50 years or more in areas such as genomics, social sciences, surveys, and, and so on. But it's really been ramping up in the last five to ten years. The Holdren memo from the White House and the Obama administration was the one that required open access to publications and to data for all U.S. Uh, large funding agencies. The European Commission has been even more aggressive in declaring that open Open, uh, open science, open access publications, and open data are official policy of the European Union. And so all new grants going forward are required to have open data. They're making very specific plans, uh, not only through the rest of the horizon in 2020, but into the ninth framework program, which will run from 2021 to 2028, and really thinking about this as, uh, as the future approach. So the, the challenge then is to think about how you actually accomplish open data and reuse on the ground. Now, the book of mine that uh, uh, Dr. Van Horn uh, mentioned that came out about two years ago from MIT Press uh, surveyed a wide range of policies up, up to that point, and I was able to categorize the, the various motivations and arguments in these public policy documents into four general categories. The one that you hear most often is that 
research data should be shared so that we can reproduce research. And in some cases that's feasible and possible, but it's actually extremely difficult and extremely contentious in most fields as to what reproducibility actually means. It tends to be in more computational areas that reproducibility is actually feasible or accomplishable. We can do things we can verify, we can validate, we can replicate, but true reproducibility is probably the biggest challenge of all. The second category is making public assets available to the public on the grounds that most big science, including most uh, public health and medicine research, is accomplished with public funding, with taxpayer dollars, euros, yen, and so on, is that the public should have access to the publications and to, to the data. They should be useful for research purposes. Uh, thirdly, to leverage the investments, it costs a great deal of money, no matter what the currency, to accomplish the research and to produce the data. So in what ways can we leverage those data and make them useful for other purposes across time? Again, not easy to do, but these are large goals. The last one, which in many respects is cumulative, is to advance research and innovation. Uh, on the at least theoretical grounds that if you make data more widely available, other people can use it for unseen purposes, uh, ask new questions, build new programs, even build new new companies. So that's as all of those, those reasons are why public policy around the world, especially in the Western world, are moving very quickly in the direction of open science and open data. However, we also know from a decade or two of social science research that it's hard to do for many reasons, uh, not the least of which is the lack of incentives. Scholars collaborate with each other, but they also compete. You know, the first one to a finding gets priority no matter what the prize is, whatever the journal article is, whatever the best job is. Scholars in all fields, including biomedicine, are rewarded much more for publications than for releasing data. One of the aspects of these problems that our, our group is looking at in most depth is around the practices associated with documenting data and making them available in a form that other people can use. And we'll talk about that today. The skills to document metadata, provenance, uh, version control, connecting data to the software, the tools, the calibration, the instruments, is often a set of skills that's different from the set of skills that's required to accomplish the research. Uh, the information studies field is a part of the data sciences where we're trying to educate a new generation of professionals to facil facilitate those aspects. Lastly, but by no means least, are questions of control and of ownership. It's contentious as to who actually owns data. Uh, you often have many hands, many, many universities in the pot. You've got different kinds of funding models. This is kind of a wide open area and questions of legal, op, legal interoperability are among those on the table in larger discussions of open access to data. Where our group is spending its time is uh, right now I'm really looking at questions of reuse. In our opinion, data sharing should not be viewed as an end in itself. Releasing the data doesn't get you very far if you don't release them in such a way that other people actually can reuse them. And these are some of the reasons that you might want to reuse them um, to, to reproduce, as we talked about, to replicate, to do it again, not necessarily by the same methods and means, uh, to verify, to validate. We have found in our other research and other fields over the years that uh, sometimes people are seeking data to reuse, to ask new questions, but other times they're using them for validation or comparison, uh, almost kind of background purposes, getting them from, say, uh, government sources of uh, field ground, ground truthing it's called in the environmental sciences. 
Uh, and lastly, to integrate with other data, and you'll be hearing more about that in, in the case study. Integrating requires cleaning, reconciling, standardizing in ways that also can be a major undertaking in and of themselves. So now to think about what are data in the first place. We've also found that one person's signal is someone else's noise. Just deciding what are the data out of a research project in the first place can be one of the most daunting challenges to get to the place where you could actually make data usable by some other parties. Here's an example that is, uh, on the one hand, a bit far afield from biomedicine, but one that's straightforward to explain the signal-to-noise issues. We were part of the Center for Embedded Network Sensing for the 10 years of its existence as a National Science Foundation Science and Technology Center. This image is one from a networked um, infomechanical systems uh, built by some electrical engineering teams and had, had many partners. And it was a, a huge advance forward in environmental sciences because you could get data at far more granularity and more speed from the air, the water, uh, the ground, and look for things like uh, different kinds of harmful algal blooms, looking at things like uh, methylmercury contamination in rice fields. Some very important environmental problems being studied this way. As we would interview people, uh, we would find things like an engineering researcher would say, oh, you know, temperature is temperature. If he's getting the same signal from one day to the next on his temperature sensor, he's happy, he thinks it's working, and for his standards, for his kinds of science, it's adequate. We asked a biologist on the same team the same question, and this long narrative here on the right is just a sample from what we got. He has to deal with international standards set by his field about the way in which you trust temperature. And the measurements that the engineer would get was not adequate. He could not publish in a biological journal with those measurements because they viewed them very, very differently. Now, neither of these people is right or wrong. They're both correct with respect to their field. And that, I think, again, is one of the fundamental challenges with data sharing. Uh, this image here and the quote from, uh, from my book, The Big Data, Little Data, No Data, is where I ended up with a somewhat phenomenological definition of data to say that they are representations uh, that become data at the point that you use them as evidence of phenomena. So almost anything in our world could be data but it's not data until you declare it to be data and declare it to be some kind of evidence. Again, much of what we do is look at those processes by which someone's signals become evidence for some kind of phenomena. This next slide gives you the title of our current uh, large uh, three-year grant from the Sloan Foundation, which is, if data sharing is the answer, what is the question? So we're looking broadly at why people are trying to share data and what it is they're trying to accomplish. So we're trying to explicate these concepts, such as data sharing, reuse, openness, and infrastructure across different kinds of domains, look at how practice is changing, and uh, we've called out these three factors, which again I'll discuss briefly. Those mi mixtures or combinations or configurations of expertise from different disciplines, Scale factors, is it a matter of the volume of data, the time period, uh, or what other factors? Then thirdly, and this, the centralization one really comes to bear in questions of biomedical research. So again, I'll go through very briefly and note that we have publications on all of these uh, topics already that you'll find linked uh, from the Center for Knowledge Infrastructure's website. We use qualitative methods. We do a lot of digging of publications and websites. We try to get the official story and the unofficial story about what people are trying to accomplish. Our um, 
grad students and researchers spend uh, long periods of time on site. Irena has been working with this particular biomedical group for about two and a half years already, uh, really working uh, with them, visiting their sites around other parts of the U.S. and uh, only when we understand a site well enough to be able to ask fairly specific questions do we come in and start doing interviews and she'll talk a bit more about how many interviews and, and where she is in the process for this particular study. Here's a sampling of the sites that we're in right now. We're not that big a team as it looks like this, uh, but we have been in some of these for nearly 10 years and uh, some of them for only a year or so. And I won't talk about them in any depth. The ordering here is more about how long we've been looking at them. What's useful is that we have enough breadth to get some strong comparisons looking at astronomy that's focused on a place, the sky and the universe, the earth sciences where they're drilling under the sea floor, uh, the biomedical and the computational science are both looking at particular kinds of problems uh, and the, the biomedical one is around data sharing and reuse in what is remarkably interdisciplinary context compared to the kinds of research usually done in these fields. The first question then is that one of mixtures. No, no matter how narrow a field looks, when you start digging deeper, you find that people have graduate degrees from different disciplines, different departments, different theoretical orientations, they use different software, different instrumentation, all of these things come together to influence uh, the collection, the use, and the, the uh, reuse of data. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which has been running, uh, actually the, the main parts of it, the first two parts, ran from 2000 to 2008, but it was a decade or two before that for the design. The 160 or more terabytes of data looked like a vast amount at the time they were building it. It's not so big by today's standards. The t again, the tens of millions of dollars that they spent, the new projects are much bigger than that. So the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is notable because it was built to be open data to the world for education and research from the first day. But it was built on proprietary software in collaboration with Jim Gray of the uh, of Microsoft Corporation, who's also a Turing Award winner in computer science. The Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, uh, that is going to get 15 terabytes per night, and they're spending more than a billion dollars on it. It's well over a decade along already, and we're about five years out. The, the, the target, of, of course, keeps moving forward. Then they plan to get data for about 10 years. There they've got the problem of the, uh, the of how you actually build a data commons, how you deal with free rider problems, and they're still brokering what partner is going to have access to it, but they're investing in open source software. So they're taking a different route even than Sloan did in how they're approaching open data. What are the mixtures? Many of these astronomers have all of their degrees in physics. Others come up through much more observational astronomy. A great deal of computer science is mixed in. One of the people we're working with takes PhD students in astronomy, in physics, and in computer science. Uh, these, this project is a mature discipline. They have vast amounts of data, abundant data. They have a long history of the infrastructure, trusted archives and uh, they've been doing these methods for a long time and that's true across all of these. By comparison in the earth sciences uh, we've been looking at uh, the CDEBI, the Center for Dark Energy Biosphere Investigations, that gets most of its data by drilling under the sea floor. This also is a National Science Foundation Science and Technology Center uh, that collaborates at about 35 institutions across the U.S. and then it makes grants to those uh, even more. This photo on the right is what we might call library. It's a repository. It's an open data repository. But those are frozen ice cores from under the sea floor, and those specimens are their primary data source. 
Uh, this drawing that our collaborator Peter Darch has driven shows you how all those cores come off one set of cruises, but the physical science uh, people take them down one path and the microbiological, the ones we're studying, take them down another path. I think what's mo what was most striking to us here is that decisions that are made on board the ship are absolutely critical to who can make data out of these. For the physical sciences, the, the line down the left, you can store those cores at minus four centigrade. For the microbiological down the right, you have to be able to store them at minus 80 centigrade. So unless those are frozen cold enough on the ship, they can never again be used for biological research. So those early decisions are critical long term in use and in reuse of data. So here the mixtures are on uh, the domains, many different specialties, and again we have papers on this about the mix of them uh, working together. This is a much more emergent problem. The data are scarce. They are not able to set standards yet because you get one core here, you get one core there. Many different questions and very exploratory kinds of methods. So they're trying to build capacity as opposed to the huge capacity that exists in astronomy. Um, I'm going to go brief on these other couple of questions so that we have time for the case study. Um, the scale factors, uh, big data is usually what people think is the problem, but rather we're seeing many other kinds of scale are critical. This notion of the three V's goes back a decade or so, goes from the, uh, the business world to say that the complexity of data is a function not only of volume, but of the variety, the heterogeneity, and the velocity, the speed at which it's coming at you. We see the temporal characteristics are important, the spatial characteristics, and uh, the variety of personnel and the number of personnel also to be key. Here's just one example of that is to look at uh, these, the two astronomy projects. Look at this range of time, 45 years from the time of inception of the first one of these until the end of the data collection and beyond. The kinds of uncertainty these people have to deal with is uh, also how they're thinking about how you build an open source, how you think about data, how you think about sharing. So again, briefly on the scale factors, and we published some of these elsewhere for you to think about, uh, but there's the uncertainty in the long temporal, there's the scarce data that are sparse, there's the variety of genomes studied, and then again, big differences in some of these computational areas we're looking at. Um, thirdly, and I do want to use this as a setup for a Arena's case study around how the degree of centralization matters. We have looked at, uh, we tried to compare what happens in areas like astronomy where you spend a decade building the instruments, building the data management functions so that you can pull a large archive together that everybody can use as opposed to working independently, which is much more common in biomedical, and trying to integrate them later. That, in many respects, is a much harder problem than the kind of problem that uh, astronomy is dealing with. So with that, let me turn it over to Arena, who's sitting here next to me, and uh, she will give you the example. Uh, and again, she's been in here for um, almost two and a half years now, the dissertation will come out uh, about a year from now, now in spring of 2018. I think this is going to be a very important contribution, not only to information studies, but to the biomedical areas in thinking about reuse. So, Irena. Good morning, and this is Irena. Um, thank you, Chris, for the great overview on this important topic. Uh, in my dissertation work, I really look at the practices of data reuse and integration in this scientific collaboration. Um, I'm very interested in looking at, at what happens uh, to research data once they are made available, once they are shared. So I'm asking questions such as who is reusing the data once they are available in open repositories, uh, why and how. 
My main case study is a consortium for data sharing biomedicine. Uh, over the last uh, two years and a half, uh, I conducted over 100 uh, hours of interviews um, and observations and over 30 interviews with the participants of this uh, consortium. Um, we have 10 labs involved in this collaboration and they are geographically distributed uh, all over the United States, uh, plus a team of engineers. Uh, the scientists investigated the, involved in this collaboration, they investigated the developmental and genetic factors involved in a set of rare uh, syndromes. It is, as you can understand, a highly interdisciplinary effort. Indeed, the investigators, the spam molecular and developmental biology, computational biology, medicine, computer engineers, but also computer modeling. Um, the goal behind this collaboration is really to fund the collection of this new um, and advanced genomic and imaging data that is related to these rare syndromes. And by making all the data openly available for reuse, the end, uh, the end goal is to encourage collaborative efforts and systemic approaches to knowledge discovery. Um, also, to make the data sharing process and reuse faster and also collaboration happening uh, faster, scientists, are, uh, scientists who are collaborating um, in this uh, consortium, they are expected to make the, um, all the research data available prior to publication, which means that as soon as the data are collected, cleaned, curated, um, they are ready to be shared. Um, just a little bit more about this. Uh, consortium and their work. The data collected by this community includes uh, um, patients' images, uh, metrics for anatomy norms, uh, phenotypic images, uh, sequences from genomic-wide association, association studies, uh, but also results uh, from gene proteins function validation studies. And um, which, um, this is one of the challenges of this consortium is that data are collected from four different uh, model orga organisms. So uh, we have humans, uh, mice, uh, zebrafish, and uh, chimpanzee. Um, so as you understand, it's a really uh, heterogeneous uh, set of actors. Okay. Um, so I want to present now my findings so far. As Chris was saying, I will graduate in a year or so, so I'm still in the process of finishing my data collection, but I have quite some data. Um, uh, so, in terms of data sharing practices, uh, what we are finding is that most of the labs uh, um, involved, they, did, they really didn't have any particular problems with making their data available, openly available on the shared repository. Um, this was partially, uh, we were partially surprised. Um, because initially we expected the scientists to be kind of reluctant to share their data prior to publication, but this really didn't happen. Almost all the data sets are indeed collected by the, com uh, by the community and are available on the centralized database created by the consortium. Um, however, when we look at who is reusing the data and how, a set of concerns and challenges emerged so basically what we are finding that re is that reusing the, uh, these unpublished data is much more difficult than sharing the data themselves. Um, we found that data reuse practices are not homogeneous, but they really vary by skills, expertise, disciplinary focus, and types of data. So on one hand, we found some shared concerns across most of the scientists about data reuse. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we found some disciplinary sp uh, specific challenges. So now I'm going to go through my findings. Okay, so let's start with the common issues um, with data reuse. Um, first, um, we found that almost all the scientists um, uh, involved in this collaboration, they expressed uh, concerns over, reuses, uh, over using unpublished data. So from the funder's point of view, uh, sharing data prior to publication, it's of course presented as a strategy to increase efficiency and making collaboration uh, across labs faster. However, from the scientist's point of view, um, using data prior to publication represented a breach in their ways of establishing trust in others' data. So most of the scientists reporting that uh, when they 
have to decide if they want to trust or not a specific a given data set, the fact that that data set is associated to a specific study that's been published in an academic journal plays a really important role for them to decide or not to trust this data set. Um, second point, uh, most, uh, we also found that most study participants expressed concerns uh, over the quality of others' data. So, the scientists reported that um, about multiple occasions in which they invested a lot of time and efforts and resources trying to validate uh, um, other data sets at, in order to reuse them. However, in multiple occasions, they found these data sets not to be accur accurate or not working. Um, for this reason, the scientists um, they tend to reuse and publish data mostly in the context of a research collaboration where they have personal knowledge of those who collected the data, mainly because it, they, you know, um, it is difficult to go through this process um, of validating others' data for reuse because it takes a lot of time. So they want to avoid that. If they already know the scientists who collected the data, they can kind of skip this process. Um, okay. So, um, uh, my last point here uh, is that you know, probably because of this lack of trust in unpublished data and concerns about data quality, um, some participants are accessing and downloading the data from the consortium database to the goal of comparing th this data to the ones they collected themselves. So the scientists are still collecting the data sets uh, and then they are downloading also kind of the same type of data set from the uh, consortium database in order to make comparisons and do some sort of quality control, but they're not really reusing other data for knowledge production. So we can see that in this case, the duplication of effort is not avoided. Um, it's a little bit twisted. So if you have questions about this in the Q&A, you can, I can explain better. Um, I don't want to give too many details right now, but uh, this is the, the idea. Um, okay, so I just want to, I selected two uh, disciplinary specific concerns about data use that I think they're interesting. Um, so first of all, uh, belonging to a specific domain or having a particular set of skills greatly influenced the way in which the data were accessed and reused by the community. And this seems obvious, however, whenever you make uh, available data, uh, you really have to keep in mind that you have different types of users out there. And this means that you have to share data in different formats, a different level of processing, provide different type of data analysis tools, and so on. Um, and my last point uh, is related to some concerns about reusing data and approximation of results. So let me explain you this. Um, some of the scientists, not all of them, but some of the scientists involved in this collaboration, they work on particularly rare syndromes that are characterized by scarcity of data. So in other words, uh, there is really no data or very few specialized data available for these syndromes. So what some scientists are doing, they are reusing data collected by colleagues and available on the consortium database um, for their experiments. However, this data is close enough to what they're looking for, but it's not exactly what they're looking for. Some other scientists are really concerned about this practice because they're worried that by reusing data that is close enough, but is not exactly what they need, this could lead to misleading results. So again, I can give more specific uh, examples about this in the Q&A. So in general, um, what uh, I think we should um, especially when we design policies for data sharing use or infrastructure for data sharing use, uh, I think we should um, keep in mind that data reuse is not a homogeneous practice, but a set of practices. We should think about data reuse really as a process rather than as a one-time action. And then also we should keep in mind that data are validated at the multiple times during the research process and validating others' data for reuse it takes a lot of time and effort. And this is excellent. Thank you, Arena. As you can see, this is going to be a very important contribution to uh, the literature of uh, biomedicine as well as the literature of, of information studies. So I thought this was a good, good preview of it for this audience. 
and we've also have several publications already covering some of these topics that, that you can find in our linked. Uh, so let me give you just a, a few wrap-up slides. Uh, first, to summarize our research uh, themes, uh, the domains consist of multiple subdomains, and as you can see, you know, again, in this case, study, we've got many different areas uh, within this, this biomedicine, and the fact that you've got uh, four different uh, model organisms, which is a, a far more complex set of comparisons than is usually done in biomedicine. Uh, it's a good comparison to areas like the earth sciences, where people self-identify with 50 or 60 different subdomains, and still they're trying to share data, bring them together, and use them. So big data is a problem. We all know that, but it's not the only only part of the problem is the bigness. It may be how long it is, how diverse it is, uh, what kind of distribution of geography, of language, of laboratories, of specimens are involved as far as scale factors. The centralized collections, things like the, uh, the astronomy ones, become decentralized in analysis. You might look at something as big and relatively homogeneous homogeneous as the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, but you may take pieces of that and then combine them with pieces from the Hubble Space Telescope, from Chandra, from Keck, and others, so they become decentralized when you start to analyze them. The decentralized data collections processes, like this biomedical sharing, when you're trying to bring them back together and again later, those are often the most difficult to integrate and in that sense, some of the, the data reuse problems in biomedicine are probably as, as difficult as almost any other science, and certainly of the, of the ones that we've looked at in the last, uh, last decade or two. Some of the conclusions um, that we find, data can be shared in many ways, sharing uh, point to point, sharing with your colleagues, you have the best chance of transferring the knowledge, particularly the tacit knowledge that goes with it, but that doesn't scale well. Something like this biomedical sharing hub where you're trying to scale by getting different groups around the country to put things into common HUD scales better, but you can see the kinds of trust issues that arise. Uh, we feel strongly that data sharing should not be viewed as an end in itself, but rather a means to reuse and much more research and public policy should look at these questions around reuse. Uh, we know that reuse requires considerable knowledge about the data, not just what was collected, but why it was collected. What the research questions were will tell you quite a bit about what kinds of decisions that were made. The validation, the trust in the data occurs at multiple stages. Questions such as data quality, again, are rising to the top, but data quality is at least as much a matter of social trust and social relationships as it is anything that is inherent in the data per se. Stewardship and sustainability is something we have not talked very much about today. Uh, and there's experimentation going on by NIH, by NSF, by the European Commission, and others funding in this area about should the responsibility for stewardship lie with the investigator, with the institution, with the collaborator, with the, uh, with the individual universities, with the funding agencies, and all of these different models are being tried. But trust is definitely the overarching concern when you think about data reuse. What does this mean for practice? Many, if not most of you, are trying to share and reuse data. You may be running data repositories. You may be data scientists, data librarians, archivists, research facilitators. Some uh, suggestions here are to think not about how is it done in astronomy, but how is it done in this particular kind of subdomain, and how does this subdomain interact with others? We need to think about what the level of abstraction is for data sharing and integration before we can think much about curation and reuse.
things? Should we be thinking about point to point? Should we be thinking about contributing to some large curated long term uh, memory model where you've really got a long term commitment like libraries and archives? The sooner in a project that a group invests in data curation, uh, the more likely you are to create data that are going to be useful indefinitely. Decisions made in the, in the earliest stages around what kind of documentation, what kind of data reduction you're going to do will carry forward. If it's collapsed too soon, you will never be able to separate those variables again later, for example. Uh, we encourage uh, infrastructure solutions to think about shared tools and services uh, and different kinds of dis discovery mechanisms, recognizing that stewardship is going to have to be iterative, the way that you keep and manage data during the course of a one, two, or five year grant is going to be different than the way a lab manages over the course of an investigator's career or how a university or a funding agency manages long term. Back to the kinds of questions being asked internationally, the European Commission, uh, through pretty much through a gauntlet at the Research Data Alliance meeting in Barcelona two weeks ago, saying that the next, the ninth framework project will invest somewhere on the order of 80 to 100 billion euros of public money in research funding uh, between 2021 and 2028. All of that will be going into research that is necessarily data intensive and compute intensive. They don't want to see every single group trying to solve their data problems individually. They want to see much more in the way of community efforts, of infrastructural solutions and approaches. And so the, the Research Data Alliance is uh, but one place where people are trying to come together to think about broader kinds of solutions rather than each lab, each group, each university trying to do these individually because these are very big and very large problems. Let's end with just a slide of acknowledgments. Again, this is a team project. The six of us are the ones currently involved. Uh, Peter Darch, who is now an assistant professor at University of Illinois Information School, is uh, leading the astronomy work and the uh, undersea biosphere work. Ashley Sands, who's uh, now at the Institute for Museum and Library Services uh, as a program officer, uh, has been working working in uh, the astronomy areas. Arena, you have just heard from on the biomedical. Uh, Bernadette, known as Bernie Randalls, is working in astronomy and computational sciences. And Milena Golshin uh, here in Los Angeles is our data scientist and project manager who keeps all these pieces together. So very much a collaborative effort. And we have had a number of other people graduate from this group that we continue to collaborate with. Uh, so it's been a team effort. And I hope you will explore some of our publications and other work that we have done uh, that explores these questions across a number of different disciplines. Let me stop there and leave 15 minutes for questions, because surely we have provoked a number of questions. You by have now. indeed, uh, Christine. Thank you so much to Christine and Irena for uh, a really great survey of a lot of the data sharing. Uh, activities which are going on not only in biomedicine but also in in many other domains to struggle with the same problem of this as as you pointed out this very rapid kind of you know fire hose of data which is coming at us and how we deal with that how we share it turn it outwards so that uh, it can be maximally uh, used by people um, a couple of questions have come in and they are sort of asking about the role of various uh, organizations and institutions on uh, how to promote and encourage this. One particular, I want to just kind of extend that a little bit because I'm not, I don't remember if you touched on this or not, but what's the role of journals in promoting data sharing, encouraging it, and using shared data to support uh, the content of the peer reviewed literature? Do you have any comments on that? Uh, yes, I do. And again, we covered a lot of territory here in, in a short period yes. of time. Um, Journals are certainly a imp very important part of the infrastructure, and many journals, uh, and I think 
pioneering in biomedicine have required people to deposit data sets in public repositories as a condition of funding the work and that certainly promotes promotes open science the trade-off there is that we would like to see those data be deposited in repositories that are open so that you can get them and compare them and look at them over time if you publish things with a journal and the data set only exists in say supplemental materials and it's behind a paywall it may be useful for validating or verifying that journal article but it may not be in some common standard data structure where it can be reused by the community so in in our research we would say that the optimal model would be for the, the journal to require the data deposit but to deposit in a public repository such as those run by the National Institutes of Health and then provide a link and relationship. Phil Bourne, way, I think about 2005, as the uh, editor of the PLOS Computational Biology Journal, wrote a very nice little editorial talking about how uh, we should think about the database of journal literature and the database of observational data as almost interchangeable and the richer you could have those links and relationships the better you could mine start with the data go to the journal start with the journal go to the data and so on so let's think in terms of as synergistic a relationship as possible great um, one other question is some people are asking what sort of analyses are you seeing uh, come out of the use of shared data then how do you measure the impactfulness of that reuse? Does that make sense? Uh, the, the impactfulness of, of reuses. Yeah, so like for example, can one measure the impactfulness of say somebody taking data from a shared repository and through their analysis, they're seeing you know, a new publication coming out in maybe science or nature, a high impact factor journal. And perhaps that's a measure of you know, its potential impactfulness. Or perhaps it's being cited a lot, so it's like citation index is really big. I don't know, are you, are you able to track that sort of thing? Because it always kind of seems that you know, people are a little bit wary about sharing data because they're not really sure it adds any value because once people have done their initial analysis that they've wringed all the useful stuff out of it. Are you, are you getting a sense that there's, uh, there's value beyond that initial publication done by the original authors that you know, has some impact on the field? Um, yeah, so this is Irena. Um, so the situation that you described is definitely the ideal situation where you have a scientist who is downloading a data set and running a new analysis, finding new uh, things and, you know, and publishing new articles with these new analysis. However, um, so I've been observing and, you know, conducting interviews with this community for almost three years now. The fact is that uh, even data reuse takes a lot of time, right? So at least in my um, in my case study, they just started to reuse each other data, the, the scientists, but so first of all, it doesn't really happen, or I don't, at least I haven't seen this uh, so far, that you know, you have a scientist who goes uh, on this repository and download a data set and run a new analysis. It's, more, it's always in the context of a collaboration. So first, uh, what I'm really finding is that scientists, they establish a collaboration, and then, uh, you know, um, together they work out all the, um, like the, authorship and who is taking care of which part of the new analysis so even when you have a reanalysis I think it's always in the context of a collaboration and it takes a lot of time and effort um, uh, yes I think Chris wants to ask, uh, add something here Let, I'm going to take that um, up to a higher level and think about uh, the different kinds of, of uses and reuses looking at the the impact or you know, the contribution of an individual reuse is no easier than looking at the contribution of any other kind of paper. So I, th I think 
the measurement is always going to be a challenge. We can, we can look for those. The large, one of the larger questions is the difficulty of distinguishing between a use and a reuse. And we have a paper that just came out in the Data Science Journal on exactly that problem. So if you think about people you know, do, you know, building data sets, some groups, their primary work, even in biomedicine, is to produce data that other people can use. You know, and so if those people weren't just playing data producers, those data would not be there in the first place. Similarly, if some astronomers were not willing to dedicate their careers to astronomy sky surveys, those data would not be there for anyone else to use. So is the first use of evidence from a sky survey or evidence from a genome survey, is that a use or is that a reuse? And that is an unanswered question. So there's a lot of definitional issues here before we start to try to put numbers on things. The other piece is on citation indicators. And um, data citation is something, again, we put a lot of time into. I encourage you to look at chapter nine of my book, which is on um, credit and attribution of data, uh, which are really very different kinds of things. People use data from other sources that they do not cite. So for example, Irena's uh, comparison between pulling data to validate your own versus pulling data for a new research question. We found the same thing in SENS 10 years ago, where if they were using it for background calibration, they were using it, but they didn't cite it. If it was part of a new research question, then they would cite it. So whatever indicators you're seeing are um, they're a floor, by no means are they a ceiling. And we're only at the beginning of people actually putting things like uh, digital object identifiers onto their data sets. I'll look at data site and look at the work the California Digital Library and others are doing on indicators. So until people start being more consistent about citing their own data and telling people where they are, um, and citing data they use from other people, it's going to be difficult to get those kinds of indicators. That's great. We've had a couple of questions um, with regard to uh, data provenance, um, as well as common data standards for storage and uh, for describing how data have been treated. Uh, this also links into um, the uh, software tools and other processing methods that uh, people have used as part of their processing workflows. How important is it to link not only the data, but uh, to uh, the, the tools and the software utilities that people have uh, performed on the data as to kind of tracking where that data came from and what's happened to it. Did Phil Bourne feed you that question? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> That's an absolutely a central question. Again, something we could easily have, have delved into here and something that's of great concern to us. And it's one that uh, Bernie Randalls of our group is, uh, her dissertation is going to look more at that is in many cases, if you don't have the software, you don't have the data. I mean, let, let's face it, it would be hard to find a, a research project these days that doesn't have some kind of software associated with generating those data. So you need to tie those together and you need to link them. So things like the, the workflow models, Taverna and others, the computational models, Carol Goebel's work in, in Britain, in biomedicine are ones to look at there. We've particularly been looking at Jupyter Notebooks and GitHub, uh, some of the tools that people use to tie together their, uh, their publications, their data, and their software. And uh, we, have a, we have a piece that's, uh, that's in review right now on the Jupyter Notebooks in astronomy, and we're, you know, we'll certainly be looking at those in biomedicine and others. Do you want to add to that, Arena? Mm, yeah, no, I, I agree with everything you <laughs> said, Chris. Um, we are we did this analysis of how people are using the Jupyter notebooks to, again to cite their data and then to link the data with software. And again, what we are finding uh, in these other research is that even the ways in which you can use the Jupyter notebooks, that you can you know store your data in different places and link it to the publication to the software, there. Are, it's not really standardized yet, but there are many different ways in which you can actually do that to provide both the data and the software as a package. 
and we are definitely looking into new tools uh, that mm -hmm. can um, and how how efficient uh, efficient these tools are in enabling this process. So. Right. Yeah, That's certainly great. that needs to be done. But but let me put one note of caution there is the rush to standards can be risky. Uh, mm -hmm. There's always going to be a trade-off in you know, the point at which you want to standardize so that you can really get that integration and that interoperability in areas where you really still need to be pretty exploratory and uh, maybe not let a thousand flowers bloom but let 500 bloom where you're still working it out and if you standardize too quickly, you're going to, you know, to lose certain line, lines of investigation. So this is one of the things we're seeing in the, the, the undersea biosphere. It's pretty scarce data, emergent kinds of standards and practices. It's a little too soon, and they're wrestling with getting standards there, where astronomy is working from standards uh, called FITS files that were established in the late 1970s. And they're sort of stretching those the breaking point and trying to decide what's you know what's the next step um, for them. I think those are very interesting points about standards, and uh, it always seems to me that uh, they, I've been involved with several standards groups of, of uh, that I've been participating with over the years. And just when you think you've got the standard, you finally fleshed it out and whatnot. And you say, okay, today here's the standard. There's some other group that pops up like a mushroom after a rainstorm with, oh, no, we're going to define the standard. And you end up getting a little bit of this not invented here syndrome. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how to kind of socially engineer that out, or is it just to be expected? Well, the good thing about standards is there's so many to choose from. That's right. <laughs> um, so uh, maybe uh, that's just the way it is. I don't know, but it would be nice well, to see a little more uniformity of it. But well, I, but. I, I think what we need to do is bring the communities together, and that's what's been so good about uh, the Research Data Alliance, which has grown. This was established four years ago, but with the first meeting got about 300 people. This meeting in Barcelona two weeks ago uh, had 620 people from 45 countries, and the membership is up to 5,400 people from almost 125 countries in four years. That's amazing. And it is amazing, and it's the first place where people from biomedicine and archaeology and astronomy and agriculture uh, and the United Nations could all be in one room talking about questions like provenance and versioning and integration and data citation and software citation and software sustainability and data sustainability. And this so I would encourage those of you interested in questions of provenance and standards to get involved in groups uh, in RDA or other groups like that. There's a, there's national groups in addition to the international uh, before we reinvent the wheel too many more times because we've done a lot of reinvention here. One final thing in our last couple of minutes here is maybe the, each of you could comment on uh, the role of data sharing of provenance and uh, the, the data science behind it all uh, in education and training at our universities and uh, uh, schools of, of higher learning and, and the role that that plays in training our next generation of scientists. I think it's kind of an auspicious question because we are on the eve of uh, some of the marches for science which are going to be occurring around the country and I think that that's probably an important message to, uh, to convey and I was curious if either of you had uh, thoughts on that subject. Yes, um, so I'm currently helping <laughs> Chris to teach this class that she has been teaching for a long time, which is data management and curation and policies uh, for research data. As a you know, PhD student and uh, hopefully for um, future faculty uh, in, this, uh, in this field, I really believe uh, strongly in the role of education and educating researchers. Um, in understanding all, all the practices and the policies around data sharing reuse and how important it is uh, um, to make sure that their science that they are conducting is open. It's not just a matter of believing in open science, but you really have to know also how to do it. You really have to know how to curate the data, what's the metadata schema, um, what are all the requirements from the funders and so on. So this is what 
uh, Christy's teaching in her classes and I think the, the students um, here at the um, Formation Studies School, um, they're very interested in this topic and they are, you know, we, we often talk about how this should be a mandatory class mm -hmm. uh, for all like undergrad or maybe for graduate students when they start approaching the research context. Um, Yes, and we are definitely trying to involve more and more uh, students from around the campus and from different departments. Uh, um, yeah, Perfect. And just to wrap that up, that, that, was, a, that was a real gift of a question, yes. Jack, is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. to, to wrap up on, is, uh, you know, I think that it's a twofold problem. One is, as, as Arena has, has very articulately said, we need to embed notions of open science and data practice in graduate education in pretty much every field. It needs to be part of research methods mm -hmm. from the beginning. But we also need to educate a generation of, of data professionals. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the information studies approach is to think about this entire life cycle of data and from the origins all the way through the long-term stewardship. Whereas most of the data science programs are much more about computation and analysis and findings. So I would like to see us produce a whole generation that can be part of the research teams, part of the university libraries and archives, um, and part of the laboratory facilities to really, you know, think big picture and help build that infrastructure. And we're, we're in early days, but I think we're laying a good foundation. Well, with that, I want to thank uh, Christine Borgman and uh, Irana Pasqueto for uh, an absolutely uh, delightful presentation on data sharing, reuse, and why it's hard to do, and with some potential solutions in there, too. Uh, thank you so much. We it was just outstanding. Really excited to have uh, had you guys visit with us today. Um, thank you, everyone, and uh, we'll uh, see you next week uh, at our next uh, Big Data to Knowledge Guide to the Fundamentals of Data Science. Thank you again, everyone. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.